Hola, buenos días. Eh, lo primero que quiero decir es que no hace falta escribir mucho para obtener un premio Nobel. Y eso lo hemos visto, por ejemplo, en el Physical Review Letter de Higgs, que es, me parece, que una página y media. Y en este caso eh, se ocurre casi lo mismo. Bien, yo he presentado aquí este título con esta provocadora fórmula en la cual he extraído este término que es el premio Nobel de pinzas ópticas 2018. Esta es la fuerza que pues, lo que voy a desarrollar son los fundamentos que explican cuál es la fuerza que una partícula una partícula corriente, una partícula de látex, en fin, una partícula en general. Y la pinza óptica es precisamente la componente de esa fuerza que todo el mundo llama fuerza de gradiente. Es decir, que la, ahora mostraré lo que la pinza óptica es, no es nada más que un haz de luz fuertemente focalizado en la zona de su cintura y la parte eh, que hay aquí es la polarizabilidad de, de, de la partícula que es muy pequeña y se asemeja a un dipolo entonces la respuesta al vector eléctrico de la luz y luego hay otros, otros términos que van asociados a lo que se llama fuerza de scattering y aquí todavía bueno pues hay otros premios Nobel metidos en este en este tema de aquí. Bueno, en, eh, hemos conocido el 2 de octubre el anuncio de la Academia eh, Sueca de Ciencias que daba el. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe I should speak in English because I, I was advised to that somebody can't understand this uh, friendly Spanish. So I am going to change to, to, to English. The, the, uh, the Swedish Academy then um, announced groundbreaking innovation in laser physics and he gave the, the Nobel Prize to two works. One, two completely unrelated works. One was the optical twists and the other was the generation of high intensity ultrasonic optical pulses. These are the three recipients of the prize. This is Arthur Askin, the, the man responsible for the optical twisters. This is Gerard Moreau, who was the thesis advisor of Donna Strickland, a PhD student, when they published a paper which, after several years, received the Nobel Prize. Actually, the paper is this one, was published in Optics Communication in 1985. They were in the University of Rochester in the Laboratory of Laser Energetics. The lab, the lab by the, uh, I was in Rochester at that time, and actually the lab was something which was completely apart from what was going on in the, in, in the mainstream of uh, research. At the in optics there, what they actually did in this uh, lab, the lab of uh, uh, laser energetics, uh, was to uh, obtain high intensity lasers, whose main uh, target was to provide high energy for nuclear fission. So I suspect that actually this work was a byproduct of a main research. And it was named like this. And I just outlined what is this the compression of amplified super optical pulse. You have an optical pulse originated by a laser, and then this pulse has a certain bandwidth in frequencies. And then if you pass it through a grating, you know that a diffraction grating can redistribute the diffractive orders. So then you can, with your clever the design, this grating, you can stretch the pulse 
so that you increase the bandwidth. You have the same energy, of course, but the bandwidth is much increased. This pulse uh, still is not st strong. So what you do is to pass it through a regenerative amplifier, which is nothing else but a fabric perot interferometer with gains, with a material which contains gains inside, so that the, the, the light is reflected forward and backward until it exits and you get something after many travelings through the amplifier forward and backward in an amplified pulse which of course is much stronger and has the, the enormous bandwidth that you have get here so that you obtain this thing. So the idea is extremely simple. It's just to broaden the bandwidth of the initial pulse to amplify like in, in, in a laser cavity like, like this one and then you join again all the frequencies with the result of the pulse which is much higher um, if intensity and much shorter from 150 picoseconds you can reach uh, well fractions of picoseconds and actually this was uh, in the middle of Europe region the amplification of this pulse but this with the years has increased and increased and as we uh, uh, wrote in the abstract this uh, is a, a very incisive t tool in medicine and in physics to have pulses so strong and so sharp. I am not going to give more detail on this part of the Nobel Prize because I am not an expert on the details of the evolution of this thing. I'm going to switch to the optical tweezer. What is an optical tweezer? An optical tweezer basically is a beam of light which is highly focused, like this one. If you put a particle in the neighbor of the, of the beam of light, there are several forces that can act on this particle. <coughs> one force is what people call a gradient force, which I saw it in the first view now, which attracts the particle to the region of higher intensity, which is in the focus region. But on the other hand, the, the beam propagates, so it has a energy vector which propagates and then it, this vector has an associated momentum and the particle is pushed by the beam. So the optical twister is actually a game between the gradient force and the radiation, well, they call radiation pressure. I, I like to call radiation pressure to everything, but some people call radiation pressure to the to, 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 to just the linear momentum force. There are many more things involved in the radiation pressure, actually. Well, for biologists, I think that the optical tweezer is just the beam with the particle, and what they do is that they, they can functionalize the particle with molecules and Ricardo will show you uh, later how this works. Well, the optical forces are in the range of piconewtons or fraction of piconewtons. So are extremely uh, small forces. I think that they can be even greater than this range. Uh, the things have improved. The acceleration that came in, in both in the particles is uh, uh, several uh, thousands of, of g and uh, of course they can exceed the gravitational force. This is uh, the paper um, that the Swedish Academy uh, quotes as the groundbreaking paper I published a fiscal review in 1970 by ASCII. The idea of ASCII was, well, if I put a particle near the focus of a laser beam, 
which is focused by this microscope lens. The focus is the little f here. The refraction of the photons in this ray and in this ray change the direction of the photon, so there is a change of momentum, and this change of momentum creates for this beam this force, and for this beam this other force. The resultant is this one, and tends to attract the particle to the focus of the beam. Actually, uh, Aspin didn't create an optical twist here. What he demonstrated was that um, the light could push the particle, and what he did was to, to, uh, to put particles in a water cell and then illuminate them. So when he focuses on one particle, the particle was cornered. When, when the, the particle uh, struck to one of the, of, of the surfaces of the, of the cell, the, the particle couldn't move on, and because the, the radiation pressure couldn't push the particle anymore, and on the other hand, the, the, the focusing near the, the particle, the gradient force acted into play, the particle was just cornered and, and trapped there. That was the physical review letters paper by, Conner, by uh, Askin, and then many others came afterwards. Actually, in the physics today of, of last month, there is a, uh, this uh, article in which uh, this man uh, ponders the importance of the, how Bell Labs worked at that time. They had many scientific stars and they produced an, an enormous amount of quality scientific work and he, uh, what he was trying to, to convince is that this structure should be recreated again. Of course, the concept of radiation pressure has a long history and goes back to Kepler, which thought that the tail of the comets appeared because of something that the light was pushing the, the, this tail away from the line separating the, 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 the comet from the, from, from the sun. Maxwell, of course, in his uh, work on identified electromagnetic waves with light. Although uh, made the theory of the, the stress that the light could exert on bodies, but he didn't really uh, create what is later called the energy flow. That was done by Pointing. Pointing was a researcher contemporaneous of this. He started the work on this thing just in the last years of Marwell. Marwell died very, very, very young. He was not even 50. A point in work out the, the, the flow of energy and the, the effects of this flow of energy were uh, demonstrated in experiments by these people in the, in the beginning of the 900s. Of course Einstein in his uh, theory of photons and, and de Broglie and others uh, had the, the concept of the momentum associated to the photons. Compton demonstrated the scattering of photons by charged particles, in particular electrons. Letokhov started using light to cool and trap atoms. And then Arkin in Bellas enters into play at the same time Hans and Solo. Well, it's nice that Hans in he has a paper in Review of Modern Physics when he received the Nobel Prize in 1996, I think, in which he explains the genesis of how he started working with radiation pressure and atoms, because all the rage at, the, at that time was use light radiation pressure for trapping and cooling atoms, and in fact was the main thing that Askin and others were looking to. And 
uh, hands, uh, sorry, uh, two started working with, with Askin as a postdoc, and it's uh, interesting that two later received the Nobel Prize, uh, whereas Askin, uh, well, he did work on, on atoms, but the, the, the work of these people was very intensive at the time. Of course, Letohov uh, was complaining when he knew of, the, of, the, of this Nobel Prize, and well, there was uh, some interchange of, of uh, uh, letters between the Swedish Academy and the Russians. Anyway, too many hands in the same pot for atomic and molecular physics related with uh, radiation pressure. Many people deserve the Nobel Prize. <coughs> in addition to Hans and Solo, that also worked with, the, with this cooling, and, of course, later on, Cornell, Ketterle, and Beeman. It's funny that Ketterle was an associate, a research associate in MIT of, of, of David Pritchard, and Pritchard had the idea. Pritchard was a, comp a competitor of these people, or two especially, but Pritchard never got the Nobel Prize for, for this. Anyway, this is the Kepler hypothesis that we see today, the comet, the comet, that when it's near the sun, experience effectively the effect of the solar wind, which are particles, charged particles, and the radiation pressure of the light of the beam. And then it's, that is why when we, it's near the, the Earth, we see detail, which disappear when it's far away. Now, the paper I saw before by asking is not the optical twister. The optical twister is something which I am going to show later. And it works with dipolar particles. What is a dipole? A dipolar particle is something which is like a point and responds to the, to the electromagnetic field like a dipole. Well, it's something more than that. A, a dipolar particle is a particle which can be characterized by the first magnetic mi coefficients in the mi expansion. It's interesting that this is one of the uh, this this a and b coefficients a1 and b1 is one of the main topics in nano optics today because. Uh, Although the paper by me was published in 1908, so more than 100 years ago, uh, no, nobody has looked at the B1 coefficient, at the magnetic partial wave, at the first magnetic partial wave, thinking that, well, particles are, do not respond to the magnetic field or light, or, or, or the response is so, so small that is negligible. Here we have the, an example of uh, how will be this kind of magnetic particle or magnetic which behaves like a magnetic dipole. And in fact, Askin was working with these dipole particles. And this is the paper of the optical twister, in which they uh, put a expression for the gradient force that they obtained from some other works. Of course, this is in the Rayleigh limit, the particle is a dipole, but it's, it's really a, a, a static, like a static dipole, and this is the gradient of the intensity. And then the competition is between this part of the intensity, of the force, and this other part, which corresponds to the scattering force, which is proportional to the intensity of the beam, so that uh, it's just the, the momentum of the light, pushing the particles, the, the larger, of course, the energy, the larger is the, the scattering force. So it's the competition between them. So if you put particles in a water cell, and this is the beam, this, the light coming here, and then you take somehow a particle here, and you have a competition between these two forces. They obtain it 
uh, situation in which the gradient force was greater than three times the scattering force and also they obtained that this uh, energy, you see the problem that asking and many others before found for, for a demonstrating trapping of particles was this, this, this thing um, and the Brownian motion associated. So the thermal fluctuations were very difficult to tame but these people were able to, to do it. So you see the name of Chu in this uh, early paper. Uh, this book is a collection of all the works by Askin. Askin is uh, nowadays uh, is 96 years old. So is a person who had lived enough to receive finally and at last the Nobel Prize uh, that he deserves since very long ago. But anyway, there were, as I said, there were many other players in the same game. And in the, this you can read a personal feelings about the, his work, about the work of others and so on. For instance, the physical review letter paper was first sent to a committee that existed in Bell Labs that supervised whether the paper was worth to be sent for publication. And the committee made four statements about the paper and the four statements could be summarized in the famous Wolfgang Pauli uh, comment It is not even wrong. <laughs> So all the physics were no, there was nothing wrong, but so what? Anyway, he decided to send it, he had no problem because he was published in, in, in one month and a half and started with that. With that. Asking later on, uh, given the difficulty of working with, with atoms, started working and proving many other things with, uh, with cells, with uh, biological particles and so on. And I, and I think that this started to make biologists, probably Ricardo will say more details on that, uh, of being aware of, of the importance of this for manipulating matter. Well, and th this is something like a complaint uh, um, article in, in 2013 on what was then called nano tweezers, something which acts at the nano scale level. Uh, and this is the theory. So to get the gradient force that I saw it before, you all have to do is to start with the Lorentz force. You have the dipole force, which is well known, and you have here the one due to the variation to the, of, the, of the charges and the uh, magnetic field. When you work out the Maxwell equations and you consider quasi monochromatic fields, then you end up with a formula which is this one. This one was worked out here uh, with a postdoc uh, a French student, Patrick Chomé. And this, when you decompose, you see, when you take the real part of this, which is the polarizability, the response of the particle to the electric field of the illuminating wave, you see that the real, real, real of this thing is the thin plus the complex conjugate, which is nothing but the partial derivative of the square modulus. And then you have other things, which is the scattering force, of course you have the pointing vector here, which pulls the particle, and other things which are cool forces, which are all the right nowadays, but that were not much considered uh, at the time. <coughs> of course, uh, Greer is a well-known physicist working with colloidal particles. For instance, here you see experiments in what, what he did was to use um, a spatial modulator through which they projected in a, uh, a, a just in a, in a plane of a cell containing 
colloidal particles, he projected a computer-generated hologram. When you project a computer-generated hologram of intensities, then the, as you see, the, uh, here, the greater the intensity, the stronger the, the famous trapping gradient force. And then he was able to make patterns of particles which went to the high intensity maximum of, the, of this, uh, of this uh, distributions of intensity. Uh, of course, in nanofluids, I, uh, I think I, I should uh, go faster now. And now, what is the nowadays interest on the radiation pressure in, in photonics? Well, one of them is the angular momenta of light. Of course, you can make the, la the light to have a spin angular momentum due to the rotation of the polarization or due to the rotation of the wavefronts. If you put the particle at one side of the wavefront, it will spin an, an orbital angular momentum. If you put it in the center of this thing, it, it experiences a, a spin angular momentum. And tractor beams. A tractor beam is not a, is not a gradient force, but it's a negative radiation pressure force pushing the object throughout the source. And just to summarize the theory and the basics of this, when the particle responds to the magnetic vector through a magnetic polarizability, you get a more complicated expression. This was the basic expression that I saw before for response to the electric vector, and this is the response to the magnetic vector. And also, there is an interference between the electric, you see alpha E, and the magnetic alpha M polarizabilities. These are the optical twister forces, the gradient forces, due to the electric and the magnetic vector. For all purposes, this could be considered negligible, but not now. That was before. And you have here what is known as the orbital momentum of the light, which is given by these expressions. Of course, if you want the orbital momentum of light to, to have it in terms, you want to have somehow the pointing vector, you obtain this thing. Uh, I will show in the next view graph how you obtain this thing, but you also obtain a reactive momentum. And here is the responsible of the tractor beam. You see this part due to the uh, interference of the dipoles, is negative and can surpass under certain conditions, for instance, with vessel beams, can surpass all these other terms, so that you end up with something like that. Well, not for, for cows, of course, but for particles, and it is what demonstrated. Uh, this is the way um, this is the way in which the orbital momentum gives the pointing vector, but then you obtain the, the well-known Bellinfante momentum, which is something uh, that is a, is a strange uh, creature, uh, a strange thing, but anyway, has very important. Some people call it a, a, a spin momentum, uh, because it's given in terms of the, of the curl of the uh, a spin, electric and magnetic, what, what is happening with this? Uh, the electric and magnetic uh, spins of the, of the light. So this is the final expression that you obtain for the force. This is asking, optical twister. This will be an optical twister for particles around on which you have a strong magnetic fields and you can obtain particles with high magnetodielectric behavior. In fact, all semiconductor particles like uh, silicon, germanium particles, spheres, which are a little small, smaller than the wavelength, 
but not so small as to be considered as Rayleigh particles, can create a strong uh, magnetic fields around them. And this is the, the part of the radiation pressure due to the momentum, uh, which are, is responsible for the transfer of energy. This is associated to the vortices of the light in terms of the balloon phantom momentum. And then you have the interference with responsible for negative radiation pressure. And then you have reactive forces. These reactive forces are forces due to momentum which do not propagate. It's associated to, to waves which do not propagate, like standing waves by interference or evanescent waves. Or evanescent waves. Um, of course, uh, there has been also try to put forward what the optical binding, at, uh, taking advantage of the radiation pressure to, to, to push particles and binding them, so that you can uh, obtain a binding and an bonding and anti-bonding states associated with the distribution of the, of the light around the particles, and this was given even to a pattern, but actually this, um, what is called optical matter, has not gone any further. So I don't know of uh, things that really work with, with this kind of optical uh, matter. And I just finish with uh, a work done by, uh, uh, by the Ricardo and I and when he was doing his PhD here, in which we proposed using a photonic force microscopy, in which a polaritonic particle, like a metal, was scanned through a surface which has two uh, pumps, like here, and then in which you excited mean resonance. And when you uh, excited the mean resonance, you could see the signature of the, of the force in this, in, in, in this raster scanning signal. Um, people said th uh, that this was really very difficult uh, to, to, to make, to build such a, such a configuration. But anyway, we are uh, encouraged because uh, recently appeared a paper by this group of the University of California in Irvine in which they used an optical trap to actually make chirality sorting, which is separation of the signal from particles which have different chirality. And with this, I finish and I pass on my, the rest of the chart, of this talk to, the, uh, to Ricardo. Okay, so uh, thanks for the talk and, and thanks uh, for, for the presentation from the um, oops, sorry. What is this for the invitation to this talk? Uh, I will, as Manolo said, I, I will introduce the optical tweezers in biological applications. So I will discuss some something about the technology of the, I mean, the optical uh, the implementation of the optical tweezers and uh, some introduction about the scientific areas in which it has uh, it is being successful, and then I will focus on the biological applications. And finally, I will introduce some, uh, something about um, a mesoscopic system, which is something which is, uh, in, has been introduced uh, with experiments in, in optical tweezers, with optical tweezers. So uh, Manolo has been discussing about the history of the optical forces and how this guy was able to uh, build an instrument with which to manipulate the small objects. So as he said, there has been a long history of uh, success. Uh, as um, awarded by the uh, by the Swedish Academy in uh, using optical forces for uh, creating optical molasses for trapping uh, atoms and molecules and for example creating new states of matter or to manipulate the quantum states of um, of, my, of the atoms or um, quantum system 
It is also being used in order to create the interference path, I mean to create small traps for, uh, for individual atoms and to manipulate uh, qubits with, uh, with lasers. So it is also being uh, widespread used in, in nanotechnology and material science. Uh, manipulation of nanoparticles is also a very active field even today. Uh, despite it was introduced in the 1970s by Askin, and uh, this is the part uh, where, I, where I am focusing, which is the, the use of optical tweezers in uh, molecular and cell biology. So it is being important now because it is not only an instrument with which you can manipulate molecules, but it is also an instrument today with which you can um, understand uh, fundamental biological questions. Okay, so this is why it is being successful in biology. Or why is biology, I mean, the question is, uh, would a biologist uh, would be interested in solving a problem by using optical tweezers? So this is the main question that has been solved in, uh, from the 90s uh, to now, basically. So th there are different ways to manipulate molecules, as you probably know. Uh, one is the atomic force microscopy. Uh, the other is the optical tweezers, which I will explain later, and the other is magnetic tweezers. This instrument is able to manipulate particles or molecules or uh, with forces typically in the nanonewton range. Optical tweezers in the piconewton range. This is a technological um, um, result. So basically you can make cantilevers which are softer, but optical tweezers is more practical in order to measure forces in the piconewton range. And the piconewton range is the interesting range of forces uh, for manipulating uh, uh, biological uh, materials. Uh, this instrument is, is, uh, is cheap and it is easier to, to implement it. Uh, but the, the range of forces are typically very, very slow, uh, very low, uh, <coughs> below 30 piconewtons. Of, of course, these ranges can change uh, depending on the on the type of instrument that you are using. I mean, you can uh, make uh, higher uh, forces with this instrument, but one of the main problems is that with the magnetic twister you cannot create a, a 3D confinement, okay, of the um, of an object. So this is an experiment in which you have a magnetic bit which is um, uh, um, uh, pull due to the magnets and a DNA molecule, but there is no, uh, there is always a, a, a force in this direction. In the optical tweezers, you get a 3D confinement with which you can manipulate the objects in different places. So, this is the ideas uh, behind the optical tweezers that Manuel explained. The uh, focusing of the of the laser uh, makes trappable neutral particles, okay? Other particles like metallic particles and magnetic particles were discussed, discussed by Manuel. And of course, using other kind of beams, you can make another kind of things. Move uh, matter, uh, rotating, or uh, as he explained with the, with the, um, with the um, spin and angular momentum of light. But the optical tweezers in biology basically is based on a 1986 or 87, I don't remember, of this letter asking paper, in which he was able to demonstrate 3D confinement with a laser, with a laser which is strongly focused. Of course, uh, there is a, a, a much more things in, in an optical setup. There are uh, the unit objectives in order to focus the light with a high numerical uh, aperture. Uh, you need, uh, of course, lasers, you need photodetectors, position sensitive photodetectors, cameras, and especially for biology, I mean, because the instrumentation can change whether you, uh, depending on whether you are uh, manipulating at atoms, for example, or biomolecules. You need to manipulate the biomolecules in physiological conditions. Otherwise, you are not doing biology. And the idea is that you need to implement an a microfluidic chamber in which you can flow buffers in different conditions with uh, different ionic strengths or pHs. So this is the instrument that we have. Uh, I'm showing some uh, something related with my laboratory because I think it's easier and in case you, you would like to make a visit it, it would be easier to understand uh, what I'm talking. In our case we are using a counter propagating setup. Uh, Manuel explained that the, uh, uh, the light 
uh, uh, the scattering force pushes the particle in the, pa in the propagating direction. So you can balance these forces also by using two counter propagating lasers. Okay, and then you can just, uh, with the gradient forces, just act in the perpendicular directions uh, uh, to the axial, to the to the optical axis. So the idea with this is that uh, you reduce the intensity in the trap and then it, uh, you reduce uh, optical damage to biological samples. You can also uh, calibrate this trap by using the linear momentum uh, conservation. So this is a universal calibration for optical tweezers and it does not depend on, on, on uh, um, refractive indices or shapes of the particles or, um, or well, changes for example in light intensity so it is very practical and with this design you can, uh, you can do this. So I'm skipping this, this slide because I want to focus on the implementation. This is the, a typical microfluidic chamber. You have, uh, uh, we pre, uh, typically prepare the microfluidic chamber with three channels and some uh, capillaries in order to, um, um, uh, to connect the, the different channels. And here in this position is where uh, the trap is produced. So uh, uh, we use an auxiliary uh, micropipette uh, to, mani to manipulate the molecules. And, uh, for example, this is a, a video in which a, a cell is directly trapped. This is something that was uh, done in the, in the 70s, but this is a video that we have from our laboratory just to show. <coughs> and uh, here is, for example, a micro bead. Uh, it is a polystyrene bead in the trap. And another bead, a small bead, uh, which is trapped by suction on the micro pipette. Why do you do this? Because you want to, uh, typically, the, the, um, the um, uh, biomolecules are linear, then you can attach one, one end to one of the bits, another end to the other bit, and just by uh, using the micropipette you can pull on the, on the polymer. So the, the bit in the trap is now acting like a sensor for measuring the piconewton forces. So in biology, one of the, you can of course do this, this kind of experiments, or for example, you can uh, manipulate uh, centrosome, which is another work that we uh, did some time ago in order to, for example, apply electric fields. Once you have the centrosome in the trap, you can apply electric fields and measure, for example, uh, the polarizability or the electric charge of, a, of an organ, which is something that you cannot do in another way. But uh, the main advantage of optical tweezers is that uh, they act as a force sensor in the, in the pico-newton. And the idea is, is just have a, a microparticle in the trap and then uh, attach one of the po uh, a polymer by one end and by using a, an auxiliary micropipette or another trap you can pull and the, the, the bit in the trap acts like a, an electromagnetic spring in order to, which once it is calibrated you can measure these forces. Okay. So this is uh, some pictures. Uh, this is the uh, a typic, this is a typical uh, setup, which is in particular the setup that we have in one of the setups in our laboratory. These are the objectives, and here you have the microfluidic chamber. It is barely seen some uh, channels here and some uh, tubes for flowing uh, the buffers in different conditions. <laughs> Uh, this is a compact instrument that we have now in, in, in our laboratory and the idea, the main problem with optical tweezers in biology is that you want to see, well, you want to um, uh, track a movie of a dynamic process. For example, you want to see an enzyme working on, on the DNA or on a microtubule, so you, don't, you don't, uh, not only need to calibrate the trap, uh, for one instant uh, measurement, but also for, uh, for example, some seconds or some minutes. So the calibration is very important to be conserved. And there are many uh, artifactual noises, like for example, vibrations or for example, uh, uh, variation in optical power in the trap. So all of, the, all of them will be uh, combined with, uh, with the signal that you want to obtain from your sign. And this is very important in order to, it has to be reduced as much as possible. So the idea with this instrument is to uh, make uh, uh, measurements with um, uh, higher uh, signal to noise ratio. Okay? So I'm introducing this slide just to, uh, to show uh, how the cell is now uh, observed by physicists in um, uh, once uh, it, it can be I mean, forces, for example, or energies are accessible at the single uh, molecule level.
So uh, we can uh, this, I mean, the, the cell is no longer a bug what you, uh, what you uh, observe uh, biochemical reactions. The macromolecules are very big and they um, perform mechanical operations on other molecules. So this point of view, although it was um, envisioned some many years ago, it was not possible to measure these forces. With this instrument, it is possible, and once it has been introduced and demonstrated by Arthur Askin, other people came and exploited this technique uh, in order to uh, measure forces in the uh, exerted by molecules. Okay, so the cell, uh, as, I, as I say here, is a, is um, at room temperature and it is an overcrowded environment. So uh, measurements are subjected to thermal fluctuation. So everything is noisy in in these measurements, and this is an integral part of the of the uh, functions of the of these uh, biomolecules so measuring uh, you are not only measuring uh, particular forces but you also are measuring probability distributions of forces okay so this is an example of some uh, motors that were developed uh, some years ago these are synthetic motors that perform basic operations one of the um, one of the uh, common things with these motors is that the um, they uh, the experiments are performed at high vacuum and at very uh, low temperatures. Why? Because you want to remove uh, thermal fluctuations. You want to, to do deterministic uh, motors. But the idea is that these motors are non-deterministic. These, these are stochastic uh, motors. Probably this this video. Uh, this is a this is a video which which is not real, of course. I mean, it is a kinesin which is work, uh, working on the microtubules and uh, transporting, for example, recycles or mitochondria but this is a uh, this is a three nanometer uh, uh, motor which is uh, working under the fluctuation i mean it's working subjected to the fluctuations consuming atp and with a very high uh, efficiency it, uh, the efficiency of this motor is near the 80 percent okay it's compared to the microscopic uh, motors that we have this is very highly efficient despite it is working uh, on 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 a uh, on a very fluctuating environment so this uh, but uh, contrary to what can be thought these uh, fluctuations are an integral part of their function so the design is different i mean this is something that uh, biology can teach us is that the design of the, these motors are completely different to the design of uh, our microscopic motors or the ideas developed by these guys okay I'm going to show some experiments that uh, um, we has been, which has revolutionized uh, biology by introducing optical tweezers. Uh, one of the first was in, uh, by the end of the 80s, in which uh, this is a bacteria which was attached to a cobra slip, and by using uh, an optical trap here, you, uh, they were able to manipulate uh, uh, against the uh, movement of the flagella of the bacteria, they were uh, able to move uh, the bacteria. Okay, so they were able to measure the compliance of the uh, flagella uh, in order to move the, the bacteria. Some years later, uh, these people, Stephen Block, introduced uh, optical tweezers to manipulate uh, single uh, biomotors. Okay, so uh, here uh, what you have is the kinesin. There is a bit which is uh, uh, attached to the to the kinesin, and when the kinesin uh, wants to uh, walk, it is uh, drawing uh, the particle in the trap. So you can measure directly the forces exerted by these uh, enzymes, and these forces are in the piconewton range. And this is the importance. I mean, the the range of forces of the of these enzymes are in the piconewton range, and this is the importance. This is why uh, optical tweezers has succeeded in being introduced in biology because it is covering the range of forces which are uh, developing this kind of machines or for example the elastic forces of polymers I will show. This is uh, one of the graphs in which this is the position of the kinesin as a function of time. You can see that there is fluctuations and suddenly one 8 nanometer step which is correlated with the uh, tubulin uh, dimer in the, in the here. So this kind of experiments in which you can see fluctuations, one step, fluctuations, another step, fluctuations, another step, was only possible with this technique. You cannot, cannot access this uh, through structural biology experiments or biochemical experiments. It is important also that you can manipulate one single uh, kinesin and have access to the fluctuations of these, uh, of these motors. Okay? So then other uh, 
other machines were um, studied, like myosins, which are in our muscles. They are uh, working on the uh, actin filaments, or for example, dynein, which is another uh, motor protein, uh, protein which works uh, in opposite direction to the kinesin. Actually, there is a very interesting uh, competition dynamics between the two enzymes. Another important experiment that came was the uh, study of uh, nucleic acids. So this is the, the picture of the, of the paper uh, of the Nobel Prize with the structure, uh, structure of uh, double-stranded uh, DNA. And some years later, 40 years later, it was possible to use optical tweezers to uh, stretch a single DNA molecule. At the beginning, it, it just may th uh, you just may think that this is uh, interesting for uh, from uh, for biomaterials, but this is an important thing in order to understand how other motor proteins work on the DNA. I mean, if they are able to uh, bend the DNA to open the two strands, this kind of uh, the forces that are involved. I mean, understanding the mechanochemistry of the DNA molecule is important to understand the machinery in our cells. So in particular they were able to see three regimes of, elasti of, el of elasticity in the DNA molecule, uh, the entropic elasticity in which, in which you align straight the, the DNA molecule, then uh, applying forces you need to stretch uh, against the sugar phosphate backbone, and suddenly at around 65 piconewtons the base pairs and stack and the molecule uh, unwinds, and suddenly uh, there could happen some melting, some separation of the two strands, and these kind of transitions, this is actually phase transitions at the single molecule level, okay, uh, I say like this because it is not a, an infinite system, uh, it has to be um, explained in, in better detail, but actually this uh, 65 piconewton transition could be understood like a uh, phase transition at the, uh, of a single molecule. So this is an important issue in order to understand nanosystems from a thermodynamic point of view. We have also, uh, in our laboratory, we were working with double-stranded RNA, which has the same capabilities to store information than double-stranded DNA, but has different mechanical properties. I, I'm not showing here, I don't have much time to explain. Uh, optical tweezers, with this uh, design, you can uh, unfold uh, proteins. The, fold, uh, the folded structure of the proteins is important in order to understand its function, but also DNA uh, can uh, have a highly organized structure which can be unfolded by using optical tweezer. This is a rupture even in which you suddenly unfold uh, one of these structures. And this is the unfolding distribution uh, of forces. Whenever you do an experiment with a single molecule or several cycles of uh, unfold and refold a single molecule, you find different forces due to the stochastic nature of the system. Okay? And this is something that has to be considered in order to understand uh, biology. Okay, So this is uh, works on RNA polymerase, which is a molecule able to read uh, the information in the DNA and uh, transcri transcribe it to the uh, DNA, uh, RNA language. Okay, uh, This is the basically the idea. You attach the RNA polymerase, polymerase on a cover slip and one of the ends of the DNA to a bit. When the RNA polymerase tries to uh, make uh, RNA from the DNA, it is actually drawing the DNA and you can measure directly the forces on the on the trap okay with the with the with the optical trap DNA polymerases can can also be measured with this idea you have uh, your polymerase attached to a bit and another bit uh, in the trap single stranded DNA here which is replicated by the DNA okay DNA polymerase and when it is replicating it is actually drawing from the from the bit in the trap and with this idea you can measure forces as a function of time. For example, uh, energy is consumed as a function of time, everything uh, as a function of time. You cannot actually see the molecule, but you can follow its mechanical behavior. Okay? You can also, using uh, thermodynamics, for example, compute the efficiency of these uh, polymerases or calculate the fidelities of these polymerases, because actually these are information machines. This, this can be considered as uh, uh, Maxwell demons. They are not only able to do mechanical operations, but also to keep the fidelity of the cells at, uh, at, a, at a very high order of magnitude. Okay. So uh, it has also been studied the ribosome, which is uh, a complex protein which uh, uh, translates the information from the from the DNA 
uh, to the proteins, okay, and other type of machinery which works with nucleic acids like helicases, topoisomerases, nucleases, proteases. I mean, the, uh, these kind of uh, enzymes are now uh, studied from a realistic point of view as uh, motors, okay, that develop uh, mechanical operations. So, and just uh, briefly, I, I would like to introduce uh, these ideas because uh, I have been discussing about the um, single molecule approach. This is something very important. When you study a single molecule, you remove uh, interference from other processes which are taking place nearby. So then you have access to the dynamics of a single uh, motor only affected by the thermal fluctuations. So basically you are following in phase space a single trajectory, a single classical trajectory of a system. So the idea is that uh, you can study a non-equilibrium thermodynamics uh, with optical tweezers because most of the processes in the cell are away from, from equilibrium. So some people introduced this, this theorem some, some years ago which has, uh, has started to, to see thermodynamics from a, from a different point of view. I think that they call it stochastic thermodynamics. Okay, and this is an example in which it was possible to demonstrate exper experimentally the validity of uh, Jarzinski or Crookes uh, theorems. They have a, a hairpin in the, in the attached to beads, one in the optical trap in, in, and the other in the, in the tweezers. By uh, moving the micropipette, you unfold and refold the, the RNA hairpin. You can measure the work. Uh, at different speeds and then one, one of the speeds that you can use very very slowly in order to approach equilibrium and then you can measure, uh, the, um, you can estimate the validity of these approaches in order to uh, connect uh, uh, equilibrium, um, uh, for example gives energy to non-equilibrium uh, work performing the, at the single molecule level. Okay, so just, uh, well, I mean this is a, a video, just uh, this is the last uh, slide this is a very uh, spectacular video. I think that this is one of the. Uh, it was this uh, experiments were performed in 2000. Okay, okay, and the idea is that uh, you can see directly how the uh, bacteriophage can, uh, works in order to um, package uh, the DNA inside uh, its capsid. So the idea is that you have the virus attached to one of the bits. Uh, some DNA is prepackaged inside the capsid biochemically in another lab and then attached to a second bit which is in the trap. So you can keep a constant force between the two bits, flow ATP in order to, uh, for the virus to work and package the DNA and in order to keep always the same force you need uh, by using a feedback uh, mechanism in the optical tweezers to approach uh, smoothly uh, the pipette and you, uh, this way you can measure directly or you can uh, see directly the activity of this, uh, of this virus. Okay, so this is, this is the how you see with the video microscopy in the tweezers. You have a bit in, in the optical trap, uh, another in the micro pipette, and as you can see, you need to approach the bit because the, uh, the virus is packaging the DNA inside the capsid uh, in order to give the tension. So this. Uh, I mean, this is a visual experiment, but you can uh, get all the mechanical parameters of uh, one of these uh, dynamical processes. For example, the pressure inside the capsid. Inside the capsid, the DNA uh, is charged, and there, there, are, there is a very low relative humidity. So there is a, 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 a very high electrostatic pressure inside the capsid. So once the force, uh, once the, the DNA is being uh, packaged, uh, the pressure increases. And the portal motor of the bacteriophage has to use higher forces and consume more energy in order to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to package the DNA. So, uh, for example, you can uh, measure force dependent velocities. Well, I mean, the, all these kind of uh, uh, questions that are now possible thanks to the invention of Arthur Askin. Oops, sorry. And this is uh, just to conclude, the optical tweezers in biology is important not only uh, because you can manipulate uh, molecules but also uh, and mainly uh, uh, primarily because you can measure, the, uh, you have access to the forces developed by um, uh, biological machinery. You can introduce force and torque as mechanical variables in uh, biochemical reactions, actually like changing the temperature you can shift uh, equilibrium in, in, in chemical biology. 
you, ca you can have a access to bio uh, bio biomolecular motor, which are a paradigm of fi uh, Feynman machinery, and you have access to elasticity and phase transitions of biomolecules. And this uh, 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 kind of experiment has also opened uh, the possibility to follow uh, single trajectories in non-equilibrium processes in, in the cell or in, in general. Okay? So this is uh, the end of the talk, and now if you have questions, we, we are open to, to questions.